So today's podcast is on the shoulder complex. This is a podcast that is going to cover a general overview of anatomy, uh, kinesiology, and some biomechanics review. Um, for those who are looking to add context to what will be covered, you can complete optional reading either in chapter 16 of the shoulder, Dutton's fourth edition, or chapter 21, shoulder, uh, in Ryman's orthopedic clinical examination text. Several objectives are listed here that after completion of this podcast lecture and the assigned readings, uh, you should be able to answer these, such as what constitutes the shoulder complex, what various bony elements and contributions uh, are involved with regards to joint articulations and overall contributions of the, the shoulder, the various anatomy that comprises the complex, biomechanics, including things such as open and closed pack positions, muscle force couples, static and dynamic stabilizers, the stability and instability contributions of each joint, and then finally, different relationships between muscle balance, imbalance, and functional performance of the shoulder complex. As James Siriax has said, the shoulder is the most rewarding joint in the body because when a limited or painful movement is found, the finding is seldom ambiguous and often implicates the offending structure. Keep in mind, James Siriax also came towards his understanding of orthopedic manual physical therapy through a bias uh, that was definitively associated with an anatomical source of pain. I would agree that oftentimes we're able to uh, decipher what the anatomical contributions are. However, keep in mind there oftentimes are referral patterns due to visceral sources or due to referred pain from more proximal um, radicular uh, type symptoms as well. And so we'll discuss that a little bit both in this lecture and as we move forward with this unit in class. The shoulder complex as a whole consists of five bones with four articulations. Uh, we find the scapula, which would be located on the posterior aspect of the thoracic rib cage. The clavicle, which interestingly enough is the only skeletal attachment um, to the axial skeleton for really the shoulder as a whole, uh, making up the sternoclavicular joint, but um, articulating with the acromioclavicular joint to more or less anchor not only the glenoid humeral joint and upper quarter, uh, including the scapulothoracic joint to the axial skeleton. We also have the humerus, the sternum, uh, and then finally the dorsal surface of the first rib. As far as joints and spaces for the shoulder complex, there are three true joints as well as a uh, pseudo joint and a joint space. And so we have the sternoclavicular joint, otherwise known as the SC. We have the acromioclavicular joint, known as the AC, and then finally the glenohumeral joint. The scapulothoracic is not a true joint, and so oftentimes we refer to it as a pseudo joint lying on the posterior aspect of the thoracic rib cage. In our subacromial or acromiohumoral space, um, we refer to it as a joint space, though again, not a true um, uh, joint surface because it lacks uh, an articular uh, surface. What's helpful in this picture is you can visualize some of the previous uh, bony structures that we discussed both from an anterior posterior aspect as well as even through a little bit of a cutaway such that you can see the articular disc of the SC joint um, between the articulation of the clavicle and the sternum as well as being able to visualize the anterior surface of the first rib. What should be noted in this image is the size of the surface area of the humoral head versus the surface area of the glenoid, as well as several other interesting kind of anatomical structures such as the surgical versus the anatomical neck of the humerus, the articulations between the clavicle and the acromion, as well as the acromiohumoral space. So let's start by talking about the acromioclavicular joint or the AC joint. It is a plain type gliding synovial joint there is no articular cartilage though, as fibrocartilage is on the end of the bones. It is not atypical to find an articular disc, um, though it's not always present in every single shoulder. Uh, the clinical relevance of this is that articular disc is subject to tearing. It has very strong ligamentous support 
support, especially for the coracoclavicular ligament. Um, and what's interesting here is if you if you break down kind of the naming convention, it tells you where these things are are, are going uh, from, right? So, uh, for example, we have the coracoclavicular ligament. Now, you know where does this go? Well, coracoid process to the clavicle. All right, so that's the coracoclavicular ligament. Then we have the acromioclavicular ligament going from the acromion to the clavicle. We have the coracoacromial ligament going from the acromion to the coracoid process, right? Um, and then we have the conoid and the trapezoid portions of our coracoclavicular ligament. Now, um, why this is important is uh, really there's a link um, for the shoulder girdle to the clavicle. And this is tied then to all motions of the humerus, uh, being as that the clavicle provides, again, the only axial uh, skeletal anchor to the glenohumeral and also the scapulothoracic joint and the upper quarter as a whole. Now the AC joint has several osteo and arthrokinematics to be aware of. It does lack a true capsular pattern. Keep in mind capsular patterns um, we're, we're going to discuss. However, they are very much nice to know um, and they are a theoretical construct. Uh, there is not evidence to support um, the actual presence of capsular patterns in many joints. The close pack position for this joint is probably only achievable in the below 30 age group as clinically it seems to correspond to approximately 90 degrees of glenohumeral joint abduction. Once you begin to um, go above uh, 30 years of age, degenerative changes and um, arthrokinematic changes alter the ability to uh, achieve kind of a closed pack position. The open pack position is really undetermined, um, although it is likely to be when the arm is by the side um, in, and in slight um, uh, external rotation of the arm. Um, so again, something to be uh, aware of here. The AC joint is predisposed to chronic stress injury or what we might call overuse. Uh, repetitive high demand is often required. Um, it is also subjective uh, to direct trauma or, or other kind of non-traumatic factors, um, but also impact. Um, impact such as a, a fall on the tip of the shoulder um, would result in trauma, um, as well as a fall on an outstretched hand where there's kind of an impact injury. And then that grading is actually done so according to the degree of ligamentous injury. Uh, if you want to see what this might look like in real time, you're welcome to click on this link or, or go into YouTube and just type in Sam Bradford 2009 injury. Sam Bradford played for the Oklahoma Sooners. Uh, and you'll be able to see an actual um, live real time injury of the AC joint. As far as sprains are concerned, uh, this was originally described by Allman et al. in 1967 and Tossi et al. in 1963. There really are only three grades, right? So grade one is a mild overstretch of the superior ligament of the capsule, normal appearance, normal radiograph, but the individual will be complaining of pain. A grade two uh, will result in a tear of the AC ligament, the acromioclavicular ligament, a sprain of the coracoclavicular ligament, but it remains intact. And you'll start to appreciate on radiograph a slight widening of the joint space. Again, the patient will be reporting pain and you'll start to see some deformity. You might begin to see a characteristic bump. Uh, clinically, we refer to this as a step-off deformity on the lateral portion of the joint, specifically as it's stretched out or as you place a weight in an individual's hand to create a little bit of traction. Finally, a grade three to six is known as a complete disruption of both the AC and the CC ligaments. Now you'll note, okay, grade three through six, but up above we said only there's three grades. Well, grades four through six were added um, as a way in which to further kind of provide context. However, um, there really is no clinical variation here, meaning grade three and above is all complete disruption. And so for our, our uh, purposes, we are only going to refer to three grades of the AC joint. Um, and so grade one would be mild, grade two is a tear of just the AC ligament, and then grade three is going to be a complete disruption of both AC and CC ligaments. Um, and so we refer to this as a separated shoulder. Almost always the treatment is conservative, 
Um, really the only time that we pursue a more non-conservative route, which would be surgical stabilization or even distal clavicle resection, is if the individual is experiencing significant symptoms, um, pain, or some other form of dysfunction that is limiting their overall functional use of the extremity. Should we use the grade four through six, grade four is severe pain and that clavicle is displaced posteriorly, this might be where we start to look at clavicle resection or you can have a grade five where there's a large displacement between the clavicle and coracoid process resulting in more pain and dysfunction. And then finally a grade six is associated once you have a fracture to the upper ribs as well as the clavicle, possibly even uh, an injury to the brachial plexus resulting in plexopathy or similar symptoms. Overall though, uh, the treatment is to manage symptoms and inflammation, again, usually conservative, and then gradually return the individual to activity. So in this image, you can start to appreciate where those different grades would occur. Grade one, just the AC ligament is overstretched. That would be at the top. Grade two, AC ligament is now torn, but the corcoclavicular ligament remains intact. Finally, grade three, and again, that's where we're gonna stop. We're not gonna go into four through six. Uh, both the AC and the CC or coracoclavicular ligaments are disrupted and torn. Um, the CC ligament, very, very hard to disrupt. Uh, it's rare to see a, a grade three unless there is a significant mechanism of injury. However, this would be what a grade three AC sprain would look like. Uh, the red circle kind of shows you or highlights where this might occur. So how might this happen? What's the mechanism of injury? Well, usually it will require a direct blow that's passed along the clavicle, um, either uh, falling on, on kind of the tip of the shoulder. Um, and most of these injuries are anterior or posterior subluxing to the clavicle. If there is an anterior subluxation of the SC joint, you often will be able to feel a difference between the clavicle and the manubrium. And the biggest reason for this is a torn anterior sternoclavicular ligament. However, Here's where we start to get into a red flag situation. If you take a lateral blow, it may also create swelling and the clavicle, because it's disrupting the sternoclavicular joint then as well, will protrude into the visceral portion of the neck. Clinically, um, this may result in an individual having trouble speaking um, if it begins to uh, cramp not only the windpipe, but then also the trachea. Um, right now, now we start to have difficulty with breathing as well. And so we have to be very careful here. Uh, the force must be quite high and quite often the uh, clavicle is going to fracture before it actually dislocates. Uh, notice again here the orientation of the trunk and shoulder relative to the ground. When a clavicular fracture occurs, the trunk is likely more vertical. Uh, when a sternoclavicular disruption occurs, the trunk is likely more horizontal and it's far more on kind of the um, uh, chromium process and, and more lateral aspect of the shoulder. AC joint degenerative changes usually follow AC sprains. Um, the AC joint can be tender to palpation, there can be crepitus, and oftentimes um, if pain does not subside and conservative management fails, which is always the first line of, of, of care or treatment, then we can start to explore surgical distal clavicle resection in very severe cases to alleviate the pain. Every, as we move more kind of midline, we find the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, it's a synovial cellar or saddle type joint formed by the articulation between the clavicle and the sternum. It does have an articular disc uh, and it's a very stable joint with strong capsular and ligamentous support. The primary ligament that maintains this is the sternoclavicular ligament, um, uh, which is known as the costoclavicular ligament, uh, kind of holding then the clavicle to uh, the first rib. So costo, that being um, associated with the ribs. It is a fulcrum for shoulder movements. Again, it's the only bony attachment of the shoulder girdle to the axial skeleton. And so range of motion will include elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, upward and downward rotation. The closed pack position is maximum arm elevation and protraction. Open pack position has yet to be determined, but similar to what we saw with the acromioclavicular joint. Finally, the capsular pattern is lacking. What's nice about this is you can start to appreciate not only the sternoclavicular ligament, but also the costoclavicular ligament uh, between the more midline proximal portion of the clavicle and uh, the first rib and its uh, costocartilaginous uh, attachment into the sternum. The SC joint pathology uh, is often due um, to the support provided by the ligaments. Uh, 
Um, and so uh, the sternoclavicular joint is very, very stable and trauma to the clavicle will usually result in a fracture rather than dislocation. We saw previously the sternoclavicular joint is susceptible. However, because of that strong support by the ligaments, costoclavicular, um, as well as the sternoclavicular ligament, it's unlikely that we see a lot of trauma uh, or really a mechanism of injury that impacts the SC joint. However, however, we can have um, a dislocation. And so um, anterior is the most common dislocation. We can also have a mechanism of injury uh, that correlates with this, which would be that lateral fall on the shoulder. Uh, pain and, and a protrusion on the medial end uh, is often the result. Uh, if there are recurrent dislocations uh, due to laxity, uh, then we can address those um, either with some uh, distraction of the shoulder to kind of relieve uh, pressure, um, but also then to provide an anterior to posterior uh, provided kind of mobilization to relocate that and then uh, ensure that those structures have time to heal uh, without further kind of damage. Next, we see the posterior dislocation. This is uncommon, but very serious, okay? And it's kind of similar to what we saw when we were talking about the AC joint and its pathologies there. Um, mechanism injury would be a blow to the medial clavicle, um, but again, the trachea can be compressed. The other structure that we previously did not discuss is the subclavian um, uh, vasculature, so to speak. And if that is compressed, um, then oftentimes reduction may be accomplished with an open or closed procedure to alleviate pressure and ensure that those structures are not compromised further. SC joint degenerative changes are fairly common, but not usually problematic. There is degeneration of the articular disc. There may be crepitus, even some pain. Um, however, uh, again, not as common. So some of our key points then, uh, let's just kind of think through this. The sternoclavicular joint has relatively weak ligamentous and capsular support, true or false? Hopefully, hopefully you say false, right? We have strong ligamentous support within that region. The something SC joint location is more dangerous, anterior or posterior. Well, we just talked about this. Uh, it would be the posterior because we run the risk of compressing both the trachea as well as the subclavian vasculature. And then finally, grade one through three AC joint sprains are usually treated conservatively, true or false? This would be true. Only in severe cases do we explore uh, clavicular resection uh, as a means to treat a AC joint sprain. All right, so we finished our discussion of both the AC and SC joint. Let's now move into the glenohumeral joint, which is the largest joint of the upper quarter uh, and the one that we're going to be unpacking in our next unit. It's a synovial multiaxial ball and socket joint with a lot of mobility. However, with that mobility comes some sacrifice to stability. The scapula is going to lie at approximately 30 to 40 degrees into the frontal plane on the thoracic cage. Uh, and so we refer to this, this 30 to 40 degrees as the scapular plane. And we have some static and dynamic stability that's, that's uh, a part of this, okay? And so we find that the static stability is provided by the capsule and the labrum, which serves to kind of deepen the glenoid uh, space, as well as ligaments, such as the glenohumeral ligaments, the coracohumeral ligaments. And these are all non-contractile tissues, meaning they're inert. They can't contract. They would... Um, uh, fall into kind of our non-contractile uh, aspect when we're doing our testing for selective tissue tension. Is it a contractile versus non-contractile lesion? Versus a lot of the dynamic stability, which is provided by the rotator cuff um, and other kind of scapular stabilizers, such as um, the upper, middle, and lower trapezius, the rhomboids, levator scap, and others. And all of these would fall into contractile tissue along with the tendons that they insert into. Now, the glenohumeral anatomy, um, we need to recognize that there is a humoral inclination of approximately 130 to 150 degrees. This is important when we recognize um, kind of the position of the, the, the joint. And in surgical repair or replacement, when we're doing, for example, a partial or a total shoulder arthroplasty, we need to really make sure that these angles are maintained, both in terms of inclination as well as retroversion, in order to not distract from the normal movement and available range of motion of the glenohumeral joint. An analogy that's been utilized uh, quite a bit for the shoulder is it is a golf ball on a golf tee. 
Uh, and so let's let's uh, turn that so we have a proper alignment. Um, keep in mind that that when that golf ball is sitting on that golf tee, uh, if you've ever been golfing, that's not a real kind of statically stable um, position. Yes, there is a, a concave surface, and so the golf ball sits in there. However, a strong wind uh, or a slight bump can kind of knock it off. Um, the shoulder's not quite that fragile. However, the static restraints are are minimal, uh, and due to that, there's a significant increase in mobility. So when we look at kind of what the static structures are, keep in mind that the glenoid fossa really only covers about a third to a quarter of the head of the humerus. So again, a little more than that golf tee on the golf ball. At any point during elevation, only 25 to 30 percent of the humoral head is in contact with the labrum. And the labrum serves to kind of deepen the glenoid cavity at about 50 percent deeper. And it attaches then to the margin of the glenoid cavity and the joint capsule itself. Now, there's several ligaments that also will contribute to some of the static stability in and around the joint, such as the glenohumeral ligaments, of which we have the superior, middle, and inferior, which kind of serve as the thickening of the anterior joint capsule. The inferior ligament is the primary restraint to both anterior and posterior dislocation of the humoral head. And so when there is chronic kind of um, subluxations and, and ultimately a dislocation, it's the inferior ligament that is overstretched, becomes hypermobile, and then leads to laxity. We also have the coracohumoral and coracoacromial ligaments, which prevent the humerus from sliding cranially and provide a roof over the glenohumeral joint. Finally, there's a posterior capsule and then just overall joint cohesion and, and geometry, essentially how well the, the bones fit together and the congruency that they have. Now, we should note a few things about the capsule. First, the glenoid labrum is the base of the capsule. All right? It's intrinsically a part of the capsule. If you tear it away, you're damaging the capsule itself. So when we have labral tears, we actually start to compromise the static stability of the joint. The other thing we should note is that the capsule is weakest on the anterior aspect, both between the superior and the middle glenohumeral ligaments. And so clinically, this contributes to this instability or subluxation that we see typically in the anterior direction, which has been an argument for why we very rarely mobilize the glenohumeral joint anteriorly uh, and why we focus more posteriorly. However, that's not to say that we never see a need to create an anterior mobility. Um, we have to assess the joint as a whole and make sure that we're addressing any limitations that are found. The capsule will have two predictable bursa. Uh, there's one with the biceps and a second with the subscapula. Uh, the subscapular bursa allows the subscapular tendon to, to really kind of move across the joint without damage to rub. The biceps bursa, and this is where the biceps tendon actually enters through the intertubercular groove on the anterior portion of the humerus, um, also is there to kind of help to prevent any irritation to the long head of the biceps. Clinically, uh, it's important that we recognize where these bursa are as well as appreciate kind of the static stability that's offered to the glenohumeral joint uh, due to the possibility of an inflamed capsule, otherwise known as adhesive capsulitis. When this occurs, it can cause pain in the muscle due to the tendons that are passing through these areas and the bursa that are associated with them. And so oftentimes we'll see uh, patients who are reporting pain in these regions. Now, dynamically, our stabilizers are primarily the muscles of the rotator cuff as well as our scapular stabilizers. Overall, there are 16 muscles that are attached to the scapula. Table 16.1 in Dutton, uh, fourth edition, has a nice review of these. Um, our rotator cuff muscles, as you will likely remember from anatomy, are supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and then subscapularis on the anterior portion. We will talk about force couples and their contributions in an upcoming biomechanics review shortly. However, our primary uh, dynamic stabilizers are our deltoid, our pec major, and latissimus dorsi, as well as our teres major, which all serve to compress the joint. Secondarily, we see the long head of the biceps and the triceps acting as shunt muscles, which also contribute to a degree of compression, though more during high velocity activities, such as overhead athletes, throwing, hitting, um, things along those lines. As we review some of the anatomy, we can see the deltoid resected back, which allows us to see the subdeltoid bursa fused with the subacromial bursa, as well as a little bit of that um, biceps bursa kind of peeking out within the intertubercular groove. We can also see the capsular ligaments um, beneath the supraspinatus and the subscapularis muscles. The other image here is a nice uh, uh, cutaway 
such that you can begin to see some of the axillary recess, the joint space, and really how uh, the tendon of the supraspinatus fits right underneath that subdeltoid bursa in that um, uh, subacromial or superhumoral space. If we look from the frontal plane, uh, we're able to visualize everything very, very nicely here, and we can start to appreciate the posterior capsule, uh, the tendon structures of the rotator cuff, as well as the anterior capsule, including the middle and inferior glenohumeral ligaments and superior glenohumeral ligaments, the labrum, biceps, uh, tendon, long head, um, and kind of this lateral view gives us all of that uh, as far as an image. This view from Netter gives us all of the superficial back and a few of the muscles that attach to the scapula on the medial border, um, superior and lateral borders. Uh, it starts to give us an appreciation for how important those scapular stabilizers are to the overall dynamic stability of the joint. If we look at glenohumeral osteo and arthrokinematics then, we find that the capsular pattern is external rotation, abduction, and internal rotation. Now note, this pattern is consistent with adhesive capsulitis as well as osteoarthritis of the shoulder. However, internal rotation versus ER abduction appears to be the most limited motion in conditions with selected capsular hypermobility. So clinically, um, while we see this capsular pattern uh, making sense with arthritis as well as adhesive capsulitis, um, the vast majority of the time, uh, the posterior capsule is more so involved than the anterior capsule. So therefore, ER and IR switch, which means IR is the most notably affected or impacted in the loss of range of motion. And so you'll see this when you're working with patients. The vast majority of them have fairly well-maintained external rotation, but significantly lack an internal rotation when asked to perform. The closed back position is 90 degrees of glenohumeral abduction, along with full external rotation and full abduction. Finally, the open back position is, is more kind of traditionally thought of as 55 degrees of semi-abduction, 30 degrees horizontal adduction, but no internal external rotation. More recently, Sue and Chang and colleagues uh, in JOSPT 2002 said that the open pack position is approximately 39 degrees of abduction in the scapular plane with neutral internal and external rotation. If we look at the superhumoral space or subacromial space, um, there's approximately 10 to 11 millimeters of space there. There's a prominent feature of the scapula, and that is the overhanging acromion. And what it does is it serves to kind of provide a roof to the glenohumeral joint and, and really enlarge that socket space along with the labrum and coracoacromial ligaments. But we can begin to appreciate three of the variations of the acromion, such as type one, two, and three, uh, from this kind of frontal uh, view. So the first type one is relatively flat. Type two, we start to get a little bit of a concave surface. And then finally, type three is hooked. Now, these are appreciable variances. However, however, while they are correlated, they are not causative of pain or of impingement. And so we need to be careful to not um, uh, more or less indicate that certain anatomical variations are the cause of pain, but may be correlated instead. Here you can start to appreciate some of the, the previous structures that we've talked about, just with a slightly different view. And here again is that lateral or kind of frontal plane view that we saw earlier. Now the scapula thoracic joint is a pseudo joint. It sits on the posterior thoracic rib cage. There's really no capsular pattern or true open versus closed pack positions due to its pseudo joint uh, appearance. It lacks any ligamentous support. Therefore, there really is no static support whatsoever. However, the functional stability is fully um, more or less put on the muscles that attach to the scapula uh, to the thorax and so it relies heavily on dynamic support in order to maintain overall stability. As we look here, uh, we can start to appreciate the role of scap scapular substitutions in shoulder range of motion. Um, and so, for example, in this uh, second pick, uh, standard goniometric measurement of medial rotation of the shoulder requires adequate stabilization of the scapula, and that's noted here. However, the first pick, there's inadequate stabilization, which allows the anterior tilting of the scapula with an apparent increase in medial rotation. So when you're taking internal rotation, it's important to not allow that shoulder to glide anterior 
uh, it's important to stabilize such that you are um, getting a reliable reading. And so uh, you want to make sure that your intra-rater reliability is consistent, thus taking your measurements the exact same every single time. Now, one way to do this is to provide just a uh, hand to kind of um, positioning guard against that anterior translation. The other way you can do this is by placing a towel roll that's a little bit thicker such that the head of the humerus is kind of maintained within the scapular plane. Keep in mind the scapular plane is orientated 30 degrees to the frontal plane and so in this picture this individual is laying with their arm at a 90 degree position and so it loses some of the congruency of the humoral head uh, with the glenoid of the scapula and so that also contributes then to why we see kind of this anterior translation. So a better strategy is probably place a towel roll, a pillow, something like that to support such that the head of the humerus maintains its congruency with the glenoid within the scapular plane. Scapulohumoral rhythm uh, is a vastly important concept such that uh, when individuals are missing or, or lacking range of motion we can restore it in a timely manner. Scapular humoral rhythm is component motion that exists between the humerus and the scapula at approximately at a two to one ratio, meaning for every two degrees of elevation of the humerus, uh, we get one degree of elevation of the scapula. Uh, during the first 10 to 20 degrees of abduction, we refer to this as the scapular setting phase. And so the scapula kind of swings back and forth as the muscles are kind of deciding their length tension um, as you're going into that position and, and creating kind of this stable base upon which uh, to allow the, the shoulder to move. After that first 10 to 20 degrees, you begin to see more of a smooth motion of the scapula and the humerus in this one to two ratio, meaning one degree for the scapula, two degrees for the humerus. If you see constant winging, then there could be poor muscle control of the scapula. Now note, uh, winging should be utilized when discussing a neural involvement such as a palsy, such as an entrapment, such as a lesion, and typically of the long thoracic, um, nerve root C5, 6, and 7. If we're talking about more of a prominent, say for example, the medial border or the anterior tip, then really we should be utilizing um, a term that kind of captures this poor movement control known as dyskinesia. And uh, the researcher Kibler gave us a really nice uh, way in which to kind of uh, qualify this utilizing type 1, type 2, and type 3 Kibler position of the shoulder, which we'll talk about as we get into the shoulder uh, unit. So then normal scapular humoral rhythm, and this is taken from Newman, uh, 2002, looks something like this. And you can start to appreciate the contribution of the SC joint, the AC joint, scapula thoracic, and glenohumeral. We're specifically going to be concerned with the contributions of the scapula thoracic and glenohumeral, though we also look at the AC joint, SC joint would kind of take last uh, phase. Note that through the early phase, again, this is where the setting phase is occurring, uh, but we still get 30 degrees of upward rotation through that first 90. From 90 to 180, we get additional uh, 30 degrees of upward rotation for a total of 60 degrees of rotation. However, the scapula really stops its rotation when the arm is elevated to approximately 140 degrees. All the rest of that comes from the glenohumeral joint itself, sliding typically in an inferior posterior fashion. The AC joint primarily is going to um, be contributing once we get into the late phase, specifically 90 to 180. Uh, the early phase really only has about five degrees of upward rotation, so very, very small uh, in, in the hole. So if someone is lacking that early phase, uh, zero to nine degrees, it's li not likely the, the AC joint is at, at fault. Um, however, late phase, we do want to address any type of AC joint uh, restriction that may be present. Now, when we talk about palpation, um, we will go over this in lab uh, specifically because palpation of these tendons is, is very important. Um, however, you should you should familiarize yourself, uh, Syriax, uh, McGee, uh, Mattingly, and, and McArray, even Todd Ellenbecker uh, have, have all defined ways in which to kind of get at the tendons of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis, um, noting that the biceps long head tendon is not part of the rotator cuff, but oftentimes is uh, palpated as part of a complete screen of uh, differential diagnosis. So we will we will return essentially to this palpation slide um, in our um, hands-on lab. Table 1615 is taken from Dutton's text, 4th uh, edition. 
provided to you here such that you can appreciate the various muscles, peripheral nerves, nerve roots, and motions that are implicated. Um, if you need to review, spend some time on this slide or with your text. Uh, additionally, um, Josh Cleland's uh, Netter text has some nice tables that also provide this information to you. Before wrapping up our kinesiology and biomechanics review, we do need to discuss uh, the force couples around the scapula and the shoulder, um, specifically pressure from the humeral head onto the coracochromial arch is going to increase by approximately 60% when the rotator cuff is not working properly. Now this is a problem because this can contribute then to primary or secondary uh, impingement. And likely this is due to poor neuromotor control, sequencing, strength, uh, overall activation. Okay. The lower portion of the serratus anterior illustrated in this image by SA and the lower trap LT contract in conjunction with the upper trap UT and the levator scapula, which in this picture isn't really denoted, that would be um, LS, to create upward rotation. And that occurs throughout the full elevation. The lower trap and serratus anterior are really crucial to provide scapular stabilization in the abducted shoulder near 90 degrees or more of elevation because they essentially keep that... Um, uh, scapulothoracic joint stabilized on the thoracic rib cage. The subscapula and infraspinatus, as well as the teres minor, are going to function to depress the humoral head uh, and really to compress the humoral head into the glenoid through kind of this anterior posterior rotator cuff force couple. Now, part of why we then palpate also the uh, tendon of the bicep is it also serves uh, kind of as this shunting type muscle to create this humoral head uh, depression and compression. Okay. And so while we're looking at primarily rotator cuff type muscles as well as some scapular stabilizers, we need to not forget the role of the long head of the biceps. Normal mechanics, and this is our goal, all right, is that the humoral head will largely spin uh, to keep the head sitting relatively central in the fossa. And so keep in mind, really the only example we have of true spin occurs at the radial head. However, um, we get we get kind of this pseudo spin. There is still a little bit of a slide and, and, and glide here. Uh, inability to maintain the spin allows the humoral head to glide abnormally, and that's not what we want, right? We want it to relatively spin um, because if it glides and slides too much, keep in mind the glenoid fossa is relatively small. So if it's gliding and sliding, we're going to lose kind of the congruency of the convex surface on the concave surface. And so where we see this begin to happen is where rotator cuff tears occur. And the reason for this is we lose, or more or less um, our, our force couple is impacted such that uh, we lose the ability to maintain kind of proper dynamics here. And so what ends up happening is the, the humoral head begins to migrate proximally. And, and Keener discussed this in 2009, but in this image all the way on the left, as well as in Newman's, you can start to appreciate. If you lose the subscap infraspinatus, teres minor, um, even lower traps, radius anterior, things like that, um, as well as um, even the, the long head of the bicep as that secondary compressor and, and depressor, then as you move into abduction, the deltoid and the supraspinatus are really going to pull the humoral head in a in a proximal and uh, superior direction. And so what ends up happening is we lose the normal kind of glide and slide and the roll occurs such that it goes right into the subchromial bursa, the distal tendon of the supraspinatus into that superhumoral subacromial space and then can create um, things like compression, irritation, inflammation, sensitivity as a whole. And so really when we're dealing with cases such as rotator cuff tendinopathy, impingement, and other uh, pathologies that implicate these structures, we really need to look at restoring the totality of the force couple um, such that we're not leaving anything on the table. This is another nice, um, uh, almost like a free body diagram of sorts, showing that when uh, the deltoid and the supraspinatus act, um, you get uh, a medial, medially directed force and an inferior force, thus uh, contributing as a whole to a net force in kind of this inferior medial direction. Um, that's good, uh, and that's kind of what we're, what we're talking about. However, however, we still need things like the lower trap, the lats, um, the serratus anterior, and others to provide that inferior medial uh, directed force as well.
So when we look at scapular femoral rhythm then, kind of wrapping up, the glenohumeral joint accounts for approximately two-thirds of all the shoulder mobility. Uh, the remainder then comes from the scapular thoracic joint. However, however, as we've been saying, we need to appreciate this complex interaction of the deltoid rotator cuff uh, tendons, long head of biceps, the capsule, which is more static, the articular cartilage, as well as the scapular pivoters like the upper trap, levator scapula, the serratus anterior, rhomboids, things along those lines. Okay, um, Oatis, uh, which was your text for biomechanics, does acknowledge there's a degree of um, debate away from a, a strict two to one ratio for the scapula th uh, humoral rhythm. Um, know that this exists uh, for our purposes. We're going to, we're going to continue to kind of um, uh, buy into a two to one rhythm. However, keep in mind it, it can vary and partly why it varies is because of this complex interaction of all of these things. Um, once you start to implicate all of these structures, uh, depending upon the role, the, the, uh, viability uh, or the health of some of these structures that can start to implicate how much uh, you're getting in terms of total contribution to scapula humoral rhythm as a whole. References are listed here for you. Hopefully um, you take some time to look through Cleland's text, uh, which is a, a fantastic text, uh, orthopedic clinical exam. Uh, Peekett, McGee, uh, or not McGee, excuse me, um, Oatis, um, Ryman's text, Dutton's text, if you have further uh, questions on this. And then if those persist beyond that, uh, feel free to swing by and chat with me as well um, in order to make sure that you have a, a good appreciation for kind of the functional anatomy of the shoulder, the application of the biomechanics, uh, and, and kind of what our static and dynamic restraints are doing in and about the glenohumeral, scapulothoracic, acromioclavicular, sternoclavicular uh, joints and spaces, as well as that superhumoral subacromial space. So hopefully this helps, gives you some perspective on the joint as a whole, and we will start to apply this as we move into the lecture on the shoulder unit. See you in class.